So here we're looking at a basically normal chest x-ray. Uh, there's only actually one thing wrong with this that I can see, and that's the fact that there's an endotracheal tube in the patient's trachea here. So this patient is actually intubated. But apart from this, we're looking at a normal chest x-ray. So here we can see the vertebrae going down. We can see the clavicle, the collarbone there. Behind that we can see the scapula. And there we can just see the head of the humerus on the left side. Now the first rib is curly, so that's the first rib there. And on that side you can see it going round. So rib number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And the first ten ribs are connected to the sternum via the costal cartilage. So rib number eleven is floating in that it's not connected to the costal cartilage. And the same is true for rib number twelve. And of course they're all in their pairs. Now any x-rays that go straight through the chest are going to stain the film behind dark. Any x-rays which are partly occluded by the presence of the bone, less are going to get through, so it's going to appear lighter. So the bones are a lighter colour because they're absorbing more radiation. And if we look down here in the lung fields, we can see these lighter areas. And these lighter areas are the blood vessels going into the lung, perfusing the lung. And of course, the blood vessels taking blood back from the lung towards the heart. The dark areas are air because air absorbs less x-rays, so more radiation goes straight through. This shadow here is the cardiac shadow, moving towards the left side. This is the left lung here. This is the right lung here. And that heart is about the right size. The heart shouldn't be more than half of the diameter of the thoracic cavity and that's less, so that's counted as OK. These are the large blood vessels in the mediastinum. The aorta, for example, will be going there and round the back, carrying blood into the thoracic aorta and eventually on down into the abdominal aorta. And here we see the line of the diaphragm. So this is the abdominal cavity here below. This is where the stomach would be and the spleen. On the right side, this is where the liver would be. And we can see that the liver is protected by the lower ribs. So there we have a normal looking chest x-ray, apart from the fact the patient is intubated. So this chap was actually assaulted and uh, when he was lying on the ground someone kicked him on the left side of his chest and we can see here that we've got bruising which is developing and some scuff marks here and maybe up here as well. This is blunt chest trauma but the suspicion has to be that this patient could have fractured a rib underneath. It's possible that a rib fragment has gone down and ruptured his pleural membranes, potentially causing a pneumothorax as air goes from inside his alveoli out the way. And we also have to bear in mind that he may have a degree of pulmonary contusion underneath this because the inflammation both on the surface and within the lung itself may take time to develop. So any patient with a blunt chest injury we need to carry on monitoring them for a period of time 
Make sure their saturations are satisfactory, their oxygen saturations. Make sure they're not becoming short of breath and generally observe their well-being for a period of time. This chap was uh, involved in a fight and the guy he was fighting uh, unfortunately took out a knife and you can see where he's been stabbed on the left hand side of the chest. So we've got a penetrating chest injury and the strong suspicion has to be that air can get through there from the outside world into the potential pleural space, converting it into an actual pleural space resulting in a pneumothorax. I'm glad to see this chap's being reasonably well managed. He's got cardiac monitors on, so we're keeping an eye on his heart rate. We're keeping an eye on his blood pressure. There will be an oxygen saturation probe on his finger, which is out of shot. And I'm glad to see there's a grey large bore cannula in his left arm there, giving potentially rapid intravenous access, as we may want to give him colloidal. No, we might want to give him crystalloid intravenous fluids as a first line measure, crystalloid intravenous fluids. Well, we can clearly see that this chap is wearing quite a large chain <laughs> around his neck there. And the other thing that sort of jumps out is he's got a bit of cardiomegaly. This heart's actually somewhat enlarged, but that's a chronic condition, so it's not really of great interest to us today. But what is of very great interest to us is that we can see the line of the lung here. Because in here we can see that there's normal lung markings of the air in dark and the blood vessels in light. But here we can see that there's no lung markings because this area here is full of air which is stagnant. It's a left-sided pneumothorax. And also the suspicion with this must be that there is some tension effect developing that this is pushing the mediastinum across because this mediastinum is somewhat deviated away from the side of the chest with the pneumothorax on it. And I think we'll just have a look at the pneumothorax in a little more detail. So here we can see the line of the lung. Here there's lung markings. On this side, the lung should, of course, fully fill up the thoracic cavity, but it's not. We have the line of the lung here, and we have this area here without lung markings. This is the area of the pneumothorax, and we can see that going down. And it's particularly clear where the line of the lung, the line of the partially collapsed lung, crosses over a rib. But we can follow that line all the way down. So there's a pneumothorax all down this left hand side. Early tension effects. So it would be very advisable to start getting that air out of that potential pleural space with, the, uh, with a chest strain to get the air out and not let it back in. While we're here, we'll just look at the other lung, just by comparison, which is normal. So we have normal lung markings on that side, by way of comparison. So here we see a chap with a left chest drain in situ. We can see the chest, chest drain is going in here. It's nicely padded off and it's tied in so it doesn't fall out with sutures through the skin. 
This chap's really still being assessed, so he's got the neck collar on. He's got the blocks and everything's nicely taped down. So we're assuming there is a C-spine fracture until proved otherwise. There's also an injury to his left arm and there's a saturation probe on that finger there. Now if his other arm was healthy it might actually be better to have the oxygen saturation probe on a healthy arm rather than an injured arm because it's possible that there could be ischemic changes developing as a result of this arm injury. But having said that, the oxygen saturation probe could be useful to detect the potential development of ischemia as well. Looking at the chest drain tube there, the transparent chest drain tube going down here. Well, there doesn't seem to be a lot of blood in there. So we don't seem to be draining a hemothorax. This is a pneumothorax and the air is getting out here down to the underwater seal drain but not getting back in, meaning the pneumothorax within the patient's chest is being successfully evacuated. Well this chap was riding his motorcycle and uh, he fell off and he fell off into a bunch of uh, thicket of bushes and one of the branches penetrated his chest just here. So we see a relatively large open penetrating chest injury. This of course had allowed air to get in to the potential pleural space causing a pneumothorax, a very obvious open penetrating chest injury. And here we see the same injury from a different angle, open penetrating chest injury. So here we see the same chap that landed in the bush and we can see that there is an occlusive dressing now over the open area in the chest. Now, as we've discussed already, we wouldn't use an occlusive dressing in the first aid situation. We'd want the dressing to be secured on three sides, so we had a flutter valve effect. But now that the chest drain is in, any air in the pleural space will get out through the chest drain. So we've essentially bought off the possibility of tension effects. Therefore, it's now quite reasonable and desirable to close this off completely while we wait for a surgical opinion on a definitive repair of that injury. Well, this was another motorcycle accident. I'm afraid we get quite a few of them. And the left lung here is normal and the heart shadow is looking acceptable as well. But one point of interest I notice here is there's a lighter coloured area in the right hand side of the chest. And this is actually caused by the presence of blood. It's a hemothorax. Now, if this patient had been sitting up, the blood would have gone downhill and settled in the bottom. But this x-ray was actually taken supine. That means the patient was lying flat. So the blood just settles down towards the back of the chest. So we see this area here of hemothorax. Now, there's no obvious rib fractures on this, which is a little surprising. But what I do notice on the right side here, these are the ribs and this is the outside of the body. So these are the soft tissues of the chest here. And this dark area 
is air in the soft tissues of the chest external to the ribs. Now what do we call it if we get air in the soft tissues of the body? Well we call that surgical emphysema. Surgical emphysema. So when you palpated the side of this patient's chest it felt a little bit crunchy. You could feel the air bubbles, a bit like touching bubble wrap. So you could feel it on palpation, the surgical emphysema, and we can see it on this x-ray. And whenever there's surgical emphysema around a patient's chest, the suspicion must be that there is also a pneumothorax because this air has not come from a penetrating injury on the surface. The air has come from inside the lungs. That means by definition, there must be disruption of the pleural membranes and the chest wall. So even though I can't see a pneumothorax on this film at the moment, the suspicion has to be that one will develop. But let's just take a look at this with a little bit of magnification and I'm going to look round about the heart oh now I do notice that there is some air here around the cardiac shadow and of course that air shouldn't be there so actually that is a pneumothorax which could potentially develop so our suspicion that the surgical emphysema, which we saw here, would probably be associated with the pneumothorax. That high index of suspicion we had is actually substantiated. Although it's small, this has got the potential to develop. So it's important to palpate the patient's chest one of the things we're looking for is surgical emphysema. If we find it, the suspicion must be that there is a pneumothorax present and this patient will require careful observation to see if this is going to develop. If it does, it's going to need a chest drain to drain the air out of the pneumothorax. This is the same patient who actually did have a chest tube inserted and here we can see the chest drain going in here and it's going up the way which is good because any air that collects up here can be evacuated through the tube. It's maybe a little close to the mediastinum but we can see that that chest drain is now in situ. The presence of the chest drain is going to mean that any air which does collect here in the right pleural space is going to be drained away. So the chest drain means that we now have essentially no possibility at all of getting a tension effect because any air which does collect in there is going to drain out. So this patient is now a lot safer because of the presence of the chest drain. So here we have a CT scan. We've got the vertebrae at the back, ribs going round, cardiac shadow at the front. And this patient actually had a lung biopsy and it went slightly wrong. And we see here is the lung here here is the chest wall and this dark area here is a pneumothorax. Here is the air because we see there's lung markings here but there's no lung markings here. So we know from our anatomy that the visceral pleural membrane will still be lying in contact with this partially collapsed lung and the parietal pleural membrane will still be lining the inside of the thoracic cavity. If we see on this lung there's no actual space there between the visceral 
and the parietal pleura. It's only a potential space. So this lung is completely filling the thoracic cavity as indeed it should. But here we have a pneumothorax. And then going round I also see a light coloured area here extending round to the side. And this is blood. So there's actually a degree of hemothorax here. So the blood has settled down. This patient's actually lying on his tummy. The blood settled down here with gravity and the air has gone up. The heavy blood goes down, the lighter air goes up. And that's true whatever, whatever the position of the patient is going to be. So we've got a pneumothorax, we've got some hemothorax. This patient has a hemopneumothorax with a partially collapsed lung. So this was a young man, um, relatively thin, who developed uh, shortness of breath at home. And when he came into hospital, he had this chest x-ray done. And the lung field on the right hand side is normal. Indeed, the chest x-ray is basically normal. But we do notice that there is a line here, going down like that. And this is actually his left lung, which is partially collapsed, giving rise to this area of pneumothorax here, which also extends down. I'm going to magnify this so we can see it more clearly. This patient wasn't traumatised. This was a spontaneous pneumothorax. So here we see the line of the lung along here. This should be all the way out to the chest wall, but it's not. It's collapsed down to here, meaning that this area is pneumothorax. Here we can see lung markings. Here we can see there is no lung markings because the lung has partially collapsed. And as we go down, we can see the line of the partially collapsed lung. Down here. So this is a spontaneous pneumothorax. These patients have to be carefully observed. And if the observations indicate that the patient's condition is deteriorating, he will need to have a chest drain inserted to get that air out. Here we see a normal right lung with normal lung markings and immediately we can see a dark area on the left. And actually when we look down we can see that there's lung shadow here and here and if you remember your anatomy the left lung is in two lobes. And here we see the collapsed lower lobe. And here we see the collapsed upper lobe. So there's a very clear line here of the collapsed left lung lower lobe. Here we have lung markings. All this area here is pneumothorax. Dark with no lung markings. And indeed, it goes all the way up here. So a very large, clearly visible left hemothorax. And that's certainly going to require chest drainage. I think I will just show you this with magnification. Because we can see it so clearly. The line of the collapsed lower left lobe and the pneumothorax going on further down. So area of collapsed lung, area of pneumothorax.
going on to the upper lobe of the left lung, also collapsed. And then very clear, large area of pneumothorax with no lung markings. Now when I actually saw this film I was a little bit annoyed really because this is a film which should never have been taken. What we see is this whole right lung is one massive area of pneumothorax. Air is able to get in but it can't get out again because of a flap of tissue that lets air in but then flaps to seal so that the air can't get out again. So the air just fills up and up. And this air now here is under significant pressure. So the lung on the right side is completely collapsed. And as well as that, there is very significant mediastinal shift. This pressure has pushed the mediastinum with these precious large blood vessels like the aorta and the superior vena cava right across. The trachea is pushed right across from the right to the left side. So what we see here is a huge right-sided tension pneumothorax with very significant mediastinal shift. This patient's life is in immediate danger. Time should not have been wasted to take this x-ray. This should have been diagnosed clinically by the tracheal deviation, by the shocked tachycardic patient, by the absence of breath sounds and hyperresonance on this side. And what should have been done is a cannula should be in, inserted into the second intercostal space round about the midclavicular line to decompress this pneumothorax. If that was done, as soon as the metal part comes out of the cannula, because there's high pressure in there, it would go pssss, and the air would get out. Now the patient would still have an open pneumothorax, but it wouldn't be a tension pneumothorax. That would take all of this pressure, all of this pressurized trapped air would get out and that means that the mediastinum could revert back to a physiological position. That would mean that blood could again, again get back from the inferior and superior vena cava back to the heart and this patient could again have a normal cardiac output. So an interesting x-ray from our point of view but one which would never have been taken. This patient's life was in immediate danger. These curly lines here are just something that the patient was lying on. This whole thing is one life-threatening, massive, right-sided, tension pneumothorax pushing the mediastinum away from the pressurised side to the non-pressurised side. An immediate life-threatening condition that needs immediate decompression. Well on this film we can see a normal looking right lung but take a look at the left lung field and again immediate abnormalities present themselves. We notice that there's very significant rib fractures and they're associated with a fracture of the scapula behind but all the left lower lobe area here is just full of fluid and this fluid is in fact blood it is a haemothorax a significant left-sided haemothorax I'll just show you these nasty rib fractures very clear on the magnified view, 
broken ends of the rib and the fracture behind on the scapula but that's the lower visible part of the left lung and this area here if we compare it to the other side there we have normal lung markings on the left side that is all blood a very significant haemothorax well this patient actually fell out of a second story window um, there'd been a little bit of uh, drinking he was uh, somewhat drunk and fell out of a second story window and landed on his back and he sustained some very nasty posterior rib fractures on his back very painful rib fractures and underneath here we can see that this area is quite white now this isn't blood but it is fluid and it is inflammatory fluid because he's developing significant pulmonary contusion so the suspicion has to be that this patient's oxygen saturations may drop so he needs very careful observation and oxygenation and we can also see on the left side that the patient's stomach is filled with air and this is because he was crying and gasping because of the pain and that meant he'd swallowed quite a lot of air which had accumulated there in his stomach so multiple rib fractures pulmonary contusion causing systemic hypoxia well we can see this patient has a chest drain which is going up to drain any air that's going to rise up we can also notice there's a fractured left clavicle quite a nasty fracture of the clavicle there and very nasty rib fractures here it looks like there as well and I think I'll just magnify these rib fractures so we can see them more clearly well there's no doubt about that we can see the breach in the continuity of the rib with this fracture line here and indeed a degree of displacement in the ribs contusion simply means bruising and here we see that there's bruising left pulmonary contusion with the accumulation of inflammatory fluids giving rise to a lighter colour here so this patient's received blunt chest trauma forces have gone through the ribs injuring the lung causing pulmonary contusion and developing inflammation and at this stage we don't know how much this inflammation is going to develop so we need to monitor this patient very carefully because he could certainly become significantly hypoxic if that happens we have to make sure that this patient is adequately oxygenate, oxygenated as of course oxygen is absolutely fundamental to life so no rib fractures there blunt trauma but still quite a lot of pulmonary contusion and inflammation on the left side 